È iniziata la seconda sessione, prego. Can I now start the next session? But first of all, it will be remiss of me not to thank our host, President Casarte, and of course of, of the Italian Senate, and the President Fico of the Italian Chamber of Deputies. I've got to say you have been so far the most generous of hosts. I've got a difficulty to explain to my wife why I put so much weight on with such good meals but I'm sure I'll have to overcome it before I get back. But it is an important G20. It's important the effect, the rigorous, effective approach that we've shown to the COVID conditions, and it's the way that this House and that Italy has given a great example how you fight COVID. So I've got to say, I'm very impressed, and it's lovely to be able to be together with friends, and it is about friends that I want to open the next session, which is so important to us. And what I'd like to do is to begin to start with our next session, and I'd like to welcome back, bear with me, I'd like to welcome, welcome back for our second working session of the P20, rebooting economic growth in terms of social and environmental st sustainability. As I say, I want to begin by introducing the keynote speakers. The first speech will be from the Speaker of the Lok Sabha, the House of the People of the Indian Parliament. And our second keynote speaker will be Mr. Adeshine, the President of the African Development Bank, a world-renowned economist who has previously served as Nigeria's Minister of Agriculture, first appointed President of the African Development Bank in 2015, and re-elected for the second term in 2020. And as I said to him earlier, the Bank of England awaits for the future. <laughs> Finally, our colleague, Mr. Massa, the President of the Chamber of Deputies of Argentina, who could not attend in person to the summit, has sent a video recorded message. And that will be how oh, that delivery of the keynote speech. Before opening the debate, please allow me to remind everyone of the debate rules. The requests to speak have already been collected, and as you know, we shall follow in alphabetical order of the countries in English. Member States shall take to the floor first, followed by the P20 guest countries. In order to allow everyone to speak, it's absolutely paramount to respect the five-minute time limit for each intervention. Once the interventions are over, there will be a few minutes for possible replies by keynote speakers. And that can only be helped by people keeping to the timetable. So please, let's start. And let us make our first keynote speech from Lok Sabha. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. Are you happy to go? Thank you. No, thank you. Mani Srabati Mode Sister Mandalke Mani Sadashigan. एक एक सस्टेनेबल विश्व के निर्माण के लिए क्लाइमेट चेंज और ग्लोबल वार्मिंग मानवता के समक्ष सबसे बड़ी चुनौती है हमें इसका ऐसा समाधान निकालना है जो पर्यावरण संरक्षण भी करे 
और आर्थिक विकास की हमारी आवश्यकता भी पूर्ण करे इस महत्वपूर्ण विषय पर चर्चा संवाद के लिए हम यहां एकत्रित हुए हैं साथियों वर्ष 2015 मानव इतिहास के लिए एक लैंडमार्क वर्ष था क्योंकि इस वर्ष पहली बार विश्व के सभी देशों द्वारा व्यक्ति के संपूर्ण विकास तथा बेहतर विश्व के निर्माण के लिए आवश्यक माने जाने वाले सस्टेनेबल डेवलपमेंट गोल्स एसडीजी तय किए गए थे और ये सामूहिक संकल्प लिया था कि उन्हें वर्ष 2030 तक प्राप्त कर लिया जाएगा कोविड महामारी के संदर्भ में आज हमारे सामने चुनौती है कि हम किस प्रकार निर्धारित समय सीमा के अंदर इन गोल्स को प्राप्त करें जलवायु परिवर्तन पूरे विश्व को प्रभावित कर रहा है यदि शीघ्र कार्रवाई नहीं की गई तो इसके गंभीर परिणाम होने का अंदेशा है विकासशील देशों में लोगों के जीवन और आजीविका पर इसके प्रत्यक्ष परिणाम दिखने लगे हैं मानवता की रक्षा हेतु ग्लोबल वार्मिंग को रोकने के लिए हमें तेज गति से वैश्विक स्तर पर ठोस कदम उठाने की आवश्यकता है भारतीय संसद द्वारा इस महत्वपूर्ण विषय पर व्यापक चर्चा हुई है तथा चर्चा के पश्चात हमने पर्यावरण के संरक्षण एवं संवर्धन से संबंधित कई कानून पारित किए हैं भारत ने पर्यावरण सुरक्षा के अपने अंतर्राष्ट्रीय संकल्पों को पूरा करने के लिए गंभीरता से प्रयास किए हैं हमने 2005 की तुलना में अपने जीडीपी एमिशन की तीव्रता में 24 प्रतिशत की कमी निर्धारित समय से पहले कर ली गई है हम इस इंटेंसिटी में 35 फाइव प्रतिशत की कमी को निर्धारित समय अर्थार्थ वर्ष 2030 तक प्राप्त कर लेंगे इस प्रकार हमने अंतर्राष्ट्रीय दायित्वों के अनुरूप सी ओ टू एमिशन सी तथा एच के एमिशन को बहुत हद तक कम करने में सफलता प्राप्त करी है हम अपने दायित्वों को ही पूर्ण नहीं कर रहे बल्कि क्लाइमेट चेंज के क्षेत्र में प्रोएक्टिव रूप में कार्य कर रहे हैं 98 देशों की इंटरनेशनल सोलर अलायंस की स्थापना तथा 25 देशों की सीडीआरआई पृथ्वी के ग्रीन फ्यूचर के लिए हमारी प्रतिबद्धता को दर्शाता है आज रिन्यूअल एनर्जी की दृष्टि से भारत विश्व के पहले पांच देशों में से एक है देश के एनर्जी बास्केट में प्राशील फ्यूल का प्रतिशत धीरे धीरे कम हो रहा है मित्रों पोस्ट कोविड विश्व में आर्थिक विकास को रिबूट करने के लिए हमारे देश में कई स्तरों पर कार्रवाई की जा रही है हमारे देश की पैंसठ प्रतिशत से अधिक आबादी गांव में रहती है इसलिए रूरल इकोनॉमी को सशक्त करने के लिए हमारे देश की सरकार ने गंभीर प्रयास किए हैं ग्रामीण क्षेत्रों में स्वच्छ ईंधन के लिए उज्ज्वला योजना के माध्यम से निशुल्क गैस कनेक्शन दिए गए हैं तथा उजाला योजना के तहत माध्यम से एलईडी बल्ब का वितरण किया गया है इसके साथ किसानों के लिए सोलर पंप का वितरण किया जा रहा है बायोफ्यूल्स के द्वारा रिन्यूबल एनर्जी को प्रोत्साहन दिया जा रहा है इससे ग्रामीण क्षेत्रों में न सिर्फ प्रदूषण समस्या का समाधान होगा बल्कि उनका आर्थिक विकास भी होगा
इस प्रकार परंपरागत रूप से वन क्षेत्र में रहने वाले तथा जनजाति समुदाय के अधिकारों की रक्षा के लिए आवश्यक कानून बनाए गए हैं ताकि उनकी आजीविका की सुरक्षा के साथ साथ वनों का संरक्षण और संवर्धन हो सके हमारे प्रयासों के सकारात्मक परिणाम दिखने लगे हैं पिछले वर्षों में देश में न सिर्फ फॉरेस्ट कवर को में उल्लेखनीय वृद्धि हुई है बल्कि बायोडाइवर्सिटी की समृद्ध हुई है आज भारत विश्व के सत्रह मेगा बायो डाइवर्स देशों में से एक है इसी प्रकार अर्बन इकोनॉमी को आधुनिक आवश्यकताओं के अनुरूप बनाने के लिए स्मार्ट सिटी योजना पर काम हो रहा है जिससे हमारे शहर प्रदूषण से मुक्त हो रहे हैं शहरी क्षेत्रों में इलेक्ट्रिक वाहनों को प्रोत्साहन दिया जा रहा है तथा सोलर पैनल के उपयोग से ग्रीन एनर्जी एवं वाटर हार्वेस्टिंग जैसे सस्टेनेबल टेक्निक अपनाई जा रही है ये एनवायरमेंटल सस्टेनेबिलिटी के साथ साथ आर्थिक विकास के प्रति हमारे संकल्प को प्रदर्शित करता है हमारा लक्ष्य है कि क्लीन एवं ग्रीन एनर्जी सभी के लिए सुलभ हो क्लाइमेट चेंज परफॉर्मेंस इंडेक्स में भारत दुनिया के टॉप दस देशों में अपनी जगह बना ली है हमारे देश क्लाइमेट जस्टिस के क्षेत्र में लीडर की भूमिका में है क्लाइमेट चेंज के क्षेत्र में आज हम बहुआयामी भूमिका निभा रहे हैं एक तरफ ग्लोबल नोट के साथ हम पार्टनर की भूमिका में तो दूसरी ओर ग्लोबल साथ के ग्लोबल साउथ के साथ हम एडवोकेट का काम कर रहे हैं साथियों सस्टेनेबल पर्यावरण विकास से ही सस्टेनेबल सामाजिक विकास हो सकता है मुझे आपको बताते हुए अत्यंत प्रसन्नता है भारत सरकार ने सभी वर्गों के आर्थिक एवं सामाजिक एम्पावरमेंट के लिए कई इनोवेशन किए गए हैं खाद्य सुरक्षा एवं पोषण सुरक्षा सुनिश्चित करने के लिए कानून लाने के अतिरिक्त देश में एक राष्ट्र एक राशन कार्ड व्यवस्था लागू की है जिसके अंतर्गत सभी नागरिकों को पूरे देश में कहीं भी अनाज मिल सके संसद एवं सरकार के बीच व्यापक चर्चा एवं सकारात्मक संवाद से समाज के वंचित एवं कमजोर वर्गों को सोशल सिक्योरिटी इनकम सिक्योरिटी और जॉब सिक्योरिटी तथा हेल्थ सिक्योरिटी के लिए आवश्यक विधान बनाए गए हैं अंत में मैं यहाँ कहना चाहूँगा कि किसी भी देश की संसद अपनी विधाई बजटीय और निगरानी संबंधी कार्यों में मुख्य भूमिका निभाती है ये जनता की भावनाओं को अभिव्यक्त करती है इसलिए जनप्रतिनिधियों का ये दायित्व है कि वे महामारी के प्रभाव से उबरने के लिए एक ऐसा मार्ग ढूंढे जो सामाजिक और पर्यावरण रूप से सस्टेनेबल हो एक बेहतर विश्व के निर्माण के लिए ऊर्जा जलवायु संरक्षण तथा विकास ये तीनों आवश्यक है हमारे देश में विकास की नीति इकोनॉमी और इकोलॉजी दोनों पर साथ लेकर चलने की है हमारा मानना है सतत विकास ही आत्मनिर्भर भारत का आधार है जनसंख्या की दृष्टि से देखें तो विश्व का प्रत्येक छठा नागरिक एक भारतीय है इसलिए यदि भारत सफल होता है तो ये विश्व की सफलता है आज हमें एक बड़े वैश्विक विजन से एक ऐसे विश्व के निर्माण के लिए कार्य करना है जिसमें एनर्जी जस्टिस हो क्लाइमेट जस्टिस हो एवं इकोनॉमी जस्टिस भी हो हमारा लक्ष्य है कि ग्लोबल नॉर्थ तथा ग्लोबल साउथ के बीच में एक सेतु के रूप में कार्य करें 
ताकि एक समेकित वैश्विक कार्य नीति विकसित हो सके और पूरे विश्व के भविष्य का आधार बन सके आप सभी को बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद जय हिंद Can I say thank you to the speaker of the Lok Sabha, Speaker Bola? Much appreciated, and your words are very important. Can I bring in our second keynote speaker, Mr. Desana, who is the president of the African Development Bank? Salim say how. The Speaker of the House of Commons of the United Kingdom, I'd like to thank you very much for your kind introduction and for your very strong support for me, and also for the African Development Bank Group. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Your Excellencies, Honourable Speakers, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, I wish to thank you for inviting me to speak here today at this very important event on rebooting economic growth. Social and environmental sustainability. I congratulate Italy on its G20 presidency. I am greatly honoured to speak to you in these hallowed chambers, the Senate of Italy, the Palazzo Madama, the chambers of justice, fairness, and equity. The parliamentary speakers of the G20. And I'd like to thank all of you for your support for the African Development Bank Group. Your Excellencies, the Parliament is a house of justice, a place where citizens are heard. Allow me today to air the voice of Africa. I therefore rise, Mr. and Madam Speakers, to raise my voice on behalf of Africa. For its 1.3 billion people, whose voices need to be heard, Africa is suffering from three areas of injustice: vaccine injustice, climate change injustice, energy transition injustice. On vaccine injustice. Of the 600 million COVID-19 doses to be delivered by, COVID,、uh, by COVAX, only 71 million have been delivered, and 48 million administered. Developed countries bought up most of the vaccines. Indeed, 20 percent of the world's population bought up over 80 percent of the vaccines in the world. Vaccine nationalism for that blocked access. Global supply chains maxed out their capacities, so today, just two percent of Africa's population have been fully vaccinated, compared to 54 percent of adult population in the United States of America and 75 percent in Europe. On climate change injustice, Africa contributes less than four percent of the greenhouse gas emissions globally. But suffers disproportionately from its consequences, with increasing droughts and floods, destroying already low infrastructure levels, and causing seven to fifteen billion dollars in annual losses, which could rise to fifty billion dollars a year by 2040. Yet, Africa receives only a meager three percent of global climate financing. On energy transition injustice, the discussion now is about Africa getting out of gas. Africa is being treated just like developed countries, where the energy sector is the main source of 80 percent of the emissions. In Africa, it is the opposite. Emissions come from lack of energy, as a majority of our people depend on heavy fuel oil. And fuel wood, and kerosene as energy sources, while the rest of the world is transitioning from energy sources that give them 100% energy supplies. Africa is at ground zero. 
and just developing its energy sources. While Africa, of course, we maximally use its renewable energy sources, there are limits. We must ensure access, affordability, and security or stability of energy. If Africa uses all its gas for electricity, it will have contributed just 0.67% to global emission. Africa should not be penalized. To deny Africa the use of gas, which is far more environmentally less polluting than charcoal, kerosene, and heavy fuel oil, is to kill African economies and its industrialization. Africa cannot be poor in an environmentally sustainable manner. Developed countries should meet their promise of $100 billion a year to developing countries to help them address climate change. So let fairness run in the corridors of decision makers and justice on the ashes of inequality. From vaccine access to greater financing to support climate adaptation and the use of gas combined with renewable energy sources, let justice reign. Africa is not waiting to be helped. The African Development Bank is doing its part to support the rebooting of Africans, Africa's economic growth and to reduce some of these inequalities. The bank launched a 10 billion US dollar crisis response facility to provide financing to countries to address rising fiscal challenges at the start of the COVID-19 pandemic. The bank also launched a $3 billion fight COVID-19 social bond on the global capital markets, the largest ever US dollar denominated social bond in world history. Africa should not and must not outsource the health security of its 1.3 billion people to the benevolence of the world. Africa should not have to beg for vaccines. Africa should be manufacturing vaccines. The African Development Bank will provide $3 billion in financing to support Africa's pharmaceutical industries to ensure that the continent produces at least 70% of its medicines up from currently 30%. We will also support the manufacturing of vaccines in Africa while building pharmaceutical and biomedical scientific capacities to produce vaccines for COVID-19 and future pandemics. The African Development Bank Group is taking bold actions to tackle climate change. We have been at the forefront on renewable energy. Think of the following, Your Excellencies. The African Development Bank and other development partners financed the 800 megawatts middle solar project and the 510 megawatts new Wazazata, the world's largest concentrated solar facility. This will help Morocco to achieve its goal of 52% renewable energy mix by 2030. The bank is currently implementing a new bold initiative called Desert to Power to develop 10,000 megawatts of solar power in the Sahel region of Africa, which will provide electricity to 250 million people. It will be the largest solar zone in the world. In addition, the bank is supporting the United Nations efforts on the Great Green Wall, an environmental defense shield against desertification in the Sahel and the Sahara. The bank has committed to invest $6.5 billion in this program to boost the climate lungs of Africa. The bank is leading on climate adaptation financing for Africa. Last year, the African Development Bank invested 63% of its climate finance in adaptation, making us the first multilateral development bank globally to achieve and surpass the 50-50 parity for climate mitigation and adaptation called for by the United Nations. In his opening address at the United Nations General Assembly last month, Secretary General Antonio Guterres recognized the African Development Bank as an example for other development partners by allocating at least half of its climate finance to adaptation. The bank and the Global Center on Adaptation 
have launched the African Adaptation Acceleration Program, otherwise called AAAP, to mobilize $25 billion for climate adaptation for Africa. Your Excellencies, the bank's work on agriculture has already benefited 71 million people in the past five years, including millions with access to drought-tolerant crops to build resilience, food, and nutritional security. Your Excellencies, the Africa Continental Free Trade Area presents a huge opportunity for economic growth, but its success will depend on massive investments in infrastructure. Over the past two decades, the African Development Bank has provided over $40 billion in support of infrastructure on the continent. This places the bank far ahead of any other global or regional financing institution. To ensure inclusive growth, the African Development Bank is focusing on women and youth. The bank's affirmative finance action for women in Africa, which we call AFAWA, is helping to leverage $3 billion for women-owned businesses in Africa. Our Jobs for Youth program in Africa has the goal of creating 25 million jobs and improving the skills of 50 million youth. The future of Africa's youth does not lie in Europe or anywhere else, but in a prosperous Africa, delivering quality and inclusive growth for its large youthful population. Your Excellencies, with regard to debt, Africa needs your support. I wish to commend the G20 for its leadership on the Debt Service Suspension Initiative, as well as the G20 Common Framework to address private and commercial debt of the continent, which now accounts for 40% of external debt. The decision of the IMF to issue $650 billion in special drawing rights, SDRs, will go a long way towards macroeconomic stabilization while boosting balance of payment reserves. However, the $33 billion issued to Africa is too small and falls way below the minimum of $100 billion called for by African heads of state. I would therefore like to urge G20 countries to fully commit to the proposal that has been spearheaded by France and the United States to reallocate an additional $100 billion of SDRs to developing countries. Madam Speaker, it's very good to see you here. This is why it is important that part of the $650 billion special drawing rights issued by the International Monetary Fund should also be allocated to multilateral development banks, such as the African Development Bank, specifically for Africa. The African Development Bank can leverage these SDRs three to four times and provide much needed financing for development finance institutions all across Africa. These will complement the macroeconomic stabilization drive of the International Monetary Fund with its Poverty and Growth Trust and its Resilience and Sustainability Trust. It will unleash the complementary power of the global financial architecture, the IMF and the multilateral development banks. It will also allow the African Development Fund which supports low-income and fragile states to have additional concessional resources as we look toward a more robust 16 replenishment of the fund next year. Your Excellencies, Honorable Speakers of Parliaments for People, Planet, and Prosperity, let us ensure that we judge rightly, rule rightly, and ensure fairness for all in all your deliberations. As Martin Luther King said, and I quote, the moral arc of the universe is long, but it bends towards justice. End of quote. Let there be equity, fairness, and justice for all. Let the voices of the less powerful be amplified. Honorable Mr. and Madam Speakers, I know that you will rule justly and fairly for the people, planet, and prosperity. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Can, can I first of all say thank you for that most welcome contributions and addressing the issues that needed to be addressed on behalf of the Af African Development Bank. 
can I just say, they really do have a true champion and somebody who speaks honestly and openly and reminds us of the needs of Africa as well. Can I now go to President Massa from Argentina who centers his message by video and I think we're about to go now. Thank you. Muy buenas tardes a todos y a todas. Quiero, en primer lugar, felicitar al Parlamento Italiano por la excelente organización de este tan importante evento. Y obviamente saludar al moderador, especialmente al moderador de este panel, a Sir Lindsay Hoyle, presidente de la Cámara de los Comunes del Reino Unido, así como al resto de los expositores, al señor David Sassoli, presidente del Parlamento Europeo, al señor Ombir, la presidente de la Casa del Pueblo de India, y al señor Akingumi Adesina, presidente del Banco Africano de Desarrollo. Quiero también aprovechar esta oportunidad para saludar a cada uno de los colegas que nos acompañan en esta jornada. Antes de empezar con la cuestión de fondo, quisiera marcar dos situaciones muy importantes. La primera que tiene que ver con la reactivación del P20, del G20 de los parlamentos, que volvió a realizarse allá por el 2018 por primera vez en mi país, en la Argentina, en la Ciudad de Buenos Aires, y que nos genera una enorme alegría que se siga realizando porque de alguna manera nos permite que cada una de las casas de la democracia tengan la oportunidad en la diversidad y en la pluralidad de representación, de tener su voz expresada o representada en este P20 y en el G20. Y por otro lado, consolidar la idea de seguir trabajando a la par de cada uno de ustedes en lo que es la diplomacia parlamentaria. No tengo ninguna duda que cuando aparecen las trabas ideológicas, económicas o políticas en la relación entre los gobiernos a través de los poderes ejecutivos, la posibilidad del diálogo franco, diverso, plural, que nos permite cada uno de los parlamentos, nos da la oportunidad de seguir sosteniendo y consolidando la relación entre cada una de nuestras naciones. Y quiero agradecer profundamente que tengamos hoy la oportunidad a partir de este intercambio de experiencias de poder trabajar de manera conjunta y aprender cada uno de nosotros de nuestros aciertos y de nuestros errores. Vivimos en un mundo que sale de una crisis global fenomenal. La pandemia ha desnudado de la peor manera las debilidades y las vulnerabilidades de nuestro sistema económico de nuestro sistema alimentario y de nuestros sistemas sanitarios. Ha puesto blanco sobre negro la necesidad de que cada uno de nuestros países asuma un compromiso de construir, tal como plantea este foro, una economía social y ambientalmente sustentable. Creo en ese sentido fundamental poner blanco sobre negro un tema que es inexorable para el desarrollo de aquellos países de renta media o de ingresos bajos que somos acreedores desde el punto de vista ambiental y deudores desde el punto de vista financiero. Es fundamental que los organismos multilaterales de crédito expresados en el liderazgo del Fondo Monetario Internacional y del Banco Mundial entiendan que los programas y los paquetes que se habían estructurado en una realidad absolutamente distinta a la prepandemia deben tener o poner en consideración esta nueva realidad. No podemos pensar los países sin desarrollo desde el punto de vista del empleo, desde el punto de vista del equilibrio fiscal, desde el punto de vista de la acumulación de reservas, desde el punto de vista... De la, inter, de, la, de la posibilidad del intercambio comercial con la generación de saldos exportadores positivos. Pero pensar los países de esa manera requiere de una etapa previa, que es la discusión en el caso de los países que somos equilibrados ambientalmente, 
pero deudores desde el punto de vista financiero, de una ingeniería financiera de los organismos multilaterales que atienda la realidad de estos países en términos de tiempos y en términos de aceptar las nuevas realidades. La Argentina necesita que los organismos multilaterales y este foro se expresen claramente sobre la posibilidad de que los plazos, las tasas y las estructuras sobre las que se diseñan los nuevos paquetes financieros tengan en cuenta a los países como la Argentina, acreedores desde el punto de vista ambiental y deudores desde el punto de vista financiero. Entiendo y agradezco la receptividad de cada uno de los parlamentos para incluir este tema en los documentos. Y asumo además el compromiso de mi país de trabajar para que la ganadería se transforme también en una actividad de generación de proteínas sustentable desde el punto de vista ambiental. Pero les pido que tengamos la capacidad de pensar que mejores plazos, menores tasas y la posibilidad de acceder a capital para el desarrollo productivo es fundamental para que en el empleo y la sostenibilidad social se produzca el desarrollo de naciones como la Argentina. Muchísimas gracias por la oportunidad. Can I thank President Massa for that, so very informative once again, and has made a contribution. Can I just remind everybody, we're now going to the speakers who have got five minutes, and to help you, because I know you wouldn't want to run over, but if I give you a reminder at four minutes, that's the time to start winding up. I think it will help with the timetable if we work to help each other. So let us go to the Speaker of the Chamber of Deputies from Brazil, Mr. Lear. Senhor, senhor moderador, colegas parlamentares, senhoras e senhores, o tema desta sessão se ajusta bem ao momento em que é realizada esta cúpula conforme a vacinação avança em todo o mundo. É preciso que voltemos a pensar no futuro, na retomada econômica e no cumprimento de nossos compromissos ambientais. Para o Brasil, tais objetivos são de suma importância como país em desenvolvimento. Precisamos crescer para retirar pessoas da pobreza e dar oportunidades de vida digna a todos os nossos cidadãos. Ao mesmo tempo, temos consciência do papel que todo o país, inclusive o nosso, tem a desempenhar na busca por conter as mudanças climáticas globais. Nenhum país conhece melhor o valor de conciliar esses dois objetivos que o Brasil. Somos conhecidos por ser uma das grandes economias emergentes do mundo e também por abrigar algumas das paisagens naturais mais exuberantes do planeta. Queremos que essas continuem a ser nossas qualidades de destaque. Os empresários brasileiros têm consciência de que a intensificação das mudanças climáticas só traria prejuízos à nossa prosperidade nacional. Fenômenos meteorológicos extremos, como secas ou geadas, apenas destroem as riquezas geradas pela agricultura, uma das nossas vocações da economia brasileira. Por isso, a sociedade está cada vez mais convencida da necessidade de ação urgente contra a emergência climática. Tal convicção já está dando frutos no trabalho da Casa Legislativa que presido. Mesmo ocupada com as medidas imediatas de resposta à pandemia, a Câmara dos Deputados e o Senado Federal não deixaram de preparar, ao longo dos últimos dois anos, as condições para que a retomada econômica brasileira seja marcada pelo progresso rumo aos objetivos do Acordo de Paris e da Agenda de 2030. Em janeiro de 21, foi instituída uma Política Nacional de Pagamentos de Serviços Ambientais, que estimula atividades individuais e coletivas, voltadas à manutenção dos ecossistemas, 
Além disso, no que concerne especificamente a preservação das florestas, assunto de grande atenção internacional, a Câmara dos Deputados e o Congresso Nacional estão deliberando uma nova lei relativa ao assunto, orientada pelo trabalho de uma comissão que, ao longo do último ano, acompanhou a Estratégia Nacional de Combate às Queimadas. A Câmara também vem buscando aprimorar a matriz energética brasileira, esta em deliberação e deve ser aprovado ainda este ano projeto que regulará o mercado brasileiro de créditos de carbono. Além disso, já foi aprovado e agora está sob exame do Senado brasileiro um projeto que regula e incentiva a instalação de pequenas centrais geradoras de energia a partir de fontes limpas e renováveis. Todas as normas e propostas citadas têm o mérito de reconhecer como o lema deste encontro, que o compromisso com o planeta deve ser também um compromisso com as One pessoas. Minute, Mr. Speaker. As metas ambientais... Já termino, senhor presidente. Mundo que se propõe só serão alcançadas se forem implementadas com foco nas pessoas, apoiando sua adaptação à nova economia, criando empregos verdes, ampliando as oportunidades para todos, em especial aos países em desenvolvimento. Os parlamentares brasileiros continuarão buscando modernizar a legislação nacional, a fim de aliar o país aos mais audaciosos objetivos de sustentabilidade ambiental. O Brasil quer apoiar e ser apoiado pela comunidade internacional na construção de um futuro melhor para esta e para as próximas gerações. A pandemia mostrou que desafios globais só podem ser superados pela cooperação de todos, sem deixar ninguém para trás. Muito obrigado. What a great example of doing it within five minutes. Thank you for that. Let us go over to China and let us go to the Environmental Protection and Resources Conservation Committee of the National Party of, Con of the Congress. We are now video linked. Five minutes. Thank you, Your Excellency. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues. Good morning and good afternoon. Good afternoon and good evening. I want to first congratulate Italy on successfully organizing this important meeting and I'm greatly honored to take part in this discussion. I was greatly encouraged and inspired by the remarks of previous speakers. We know that President Xi Jinping at this year's and last year's general debate of the UN General Assembly mentioned China's ambitions for the um, carbon peak and carbon neutrality targets and also China's plan to stop building new coal-fired power projects abroad. He also identified the blueprints for China's cross-sectoral efforts to address climate change. And the National People's Congress of China is also working on legislations to, to create the legal framework for China's carbon peak and carbon neutrality targets. You know very soon that uh, COP15 of the Convention on Biological Diversity will be held in Kunming city of China. And through this conference, we will make China's contribution to the global efforts. And here on today's topic, uh, I want to talk from the perspective of the new growth logic and on how to realize a more inclusive, more equitable, more resilient and a sustainable recovery under the new development paradigm. Well, over the past seven decades, the world has achieved great progress. Emerging economies like China have enjoyed remarkable and rapid growth. Globally, world population increased by three times, average life expectancy continued to grow, per capita output increased by four times and total output grew 12 times. But such growth was mainly achieved through traditional means, especially massive investment, expanded use of traditional resources and energy and cheap labor. Consumption of fossil fuels played a major role. At the same time, we must recognize that 
More than 900 billion of the global population still has no access to electricity. Nearly 3 billion people have not been able to use clean energy to cook. Like uh, Mr. Adesina mentioned, a per capita carbon dioxide emission on the African continent is less than two tons, while for developed countries, it is generally around seven tons. We're confronted with global warming, COVID-19, and a shortage of resource supply, and are facing the twin tasks of attaining the climate goals in the Paris Agreement and promoting global recovery. It's not sustainable anymore to reboot growth via old paradigms. So we need to explore new growth models for a sustainable recovery. Uh, late last century, World Bank once put forth a new theory on measuring the wealth of nations which said we should not only focus on the traditional human capital and produced capital, but also invest in natural capital and social capital. And now intellectual capital is included as a new category. This new theory stressed the importance of raising the accumulation sustainability of all types of capital, monetary indicators apart from output and income, such as education, health, environment, and distribution of wealth, and understanding the SDGs and human development from the standpoint of increasing inclusiveness and fairness. But this gives us useful guidance as we pursue a sustainable recovery on new pathway to growth. Where in, in light of this, I wish to offer you th uh, the following recommendations. Where first, we need to invest One in all minute. types of capital, including natural capital to achieve a green, low carbon and sustainable recovery. Where so far the global recovery is mainly through traditional ways. This may be used for in short term, but in the middle to long term, it is not sustainable. So we need to explore new ways to increase, increase green investment, which can directly propel sustainable recovery. We may apply public policies that enable the growth of natural capital, social capital, and intellectual capital, and use, utilize um, market mechanisms and green finance to make investment and financing greener. Um, we also mentioned the carbon pricing. This is also a issue we should attend to. We also need to encourage uh, green innovation to foster investment models that are in line with the carbon neutrality targets and to help the world achieve climate goals and the SDGs. Where for China, we plan to invest about 45 trillion RMB yuan. Five minutes is not that's, gone. Se that's seven trillion RMB yuan in the next five years on renewables and greening of the industry, green consumption, green urbanization and innovative infrastructure in order to boost our country's efforts for green and sustainable recovery. Of course, this investment should be diversified. We can not only uh, rely on government funding, we must also mobilize private sector to invest. For second, we need to advance systemic, uh, systematic reforms to achieve a just and green transition. We're given the multiple targets for future development. We must take comprehensive and systematic actions in order to make the post-pandemic recovery sustainable. To realize a just transition, we must uh, to, in, to mainstream green and low carbon concepts in our plans for social and economic recovery. We need to align recovery in the short term with medium to long term goals for system, sustainable development to make this process comprehensive. We Can need to introduce warn, laws, regulations, please warn standards. You're you well past the five minutes, and it's unfair to other speakers. Right. Um, can I say thank you to China? We now go to the Deputy Speaker of the French National Assembly. Can we go to Ms. St. Paul?
Mesdames et messieurs les présidentes et présidents de Parlement, Mesdames et messieurs, chers amis, plus aucun responsable politique, plus aucun élu ne peut inscrire son action en dehors des contraintes que nous impose le dérèglement climatique. Nous devons penser et mettre en place des solutions rapides et efficaces. Je voudrais évoquer un outil qui s'inscrit dans cette logique tout en prenant en compte la dimension économique et sociale. Il s'agit de l'ajustement carbone aux frontières. J'appelle à en faire une des priorités de la présidence française du Conseil de l'Union européenne à compter du 1er janvier prochain. En effet, à mesure que nous prenons des mesures pour limiter la production de carbone, nous créons automatiquement des contraintes à court terme pesant sur nos entreprises pour un gain à long terme pour l'humanité entière. Notre pays est prêt à y consentir dès lors qu'il en va de notre survie, mais cet effort doit être moteur. Nous serons d'autant plus prêts à consentir à cet effort que nous introduirons des clauses miroirs. La France devra faire de l'introduction de ces clauses une priorité, notamment en matière agricole. Celles-ci permettront d'exiger des produits agricoles importés les mêmes standards environnementaux et sanitaires que pour la production européenne. Ces clauses miroirs doivent être obligatoirement incluses dans les traités commerciaux européens. Il s'agit là d'une condition indispensable pour assurer à nos agriculteurs européens une concurrence loyale vis-à-vis -vis des produits importés. Il ne serait pas acceptable que le pacte vert, qui réduit les surfaces cultivées, soit compensé par des importations qui reviendraient à importer du carbone et de la biodiversité dégradée. Qui peut comprendre qu'un État ou une zone ayant pris les mesures nécessaires importe des produits qui n'auraient pas le droit d'être produits sur son propre territoire Introduire les clauses miroirs dans les accords commerciaux est donc une condition indispensable pour assurer l'équité économique, écologique et sociale envers les entreprises européennes et en particulier les agriculteurs. Mais elle est aussi la condition nécessaire pour engager vraiment et pleinement la transformation écologique de la production et de la consommation dès lors qu'il n'y a plus l'épée de Damoclès que constitue une compétitivité déloyale. Nous, dirigeants politiques, aurions enfin quelque chose à répondre à nos entrepreneurs et à nos agriculteurs qui nous disent « Je veux bien produire de manière plus vertueuse, mais ça va renchérir mon produit et favoriser la concurrence étrangère. » Les clauses miroirs dans les traités commerciaux et la taxe carbone aux frontières engageront un cercle vertueux mondial. Cela me semble être l'outil indispensable pour concilier les aspects économiques, sociaux et et écologique. Je vous remercie. Thank you. Uh, can I say thank you to the deputy speaker? Now we come to the president of Indonesia, which I welcome, President Mahama. Speaker Mahama. Distinguished Chair and Delegates, the COVID-19 pandemic is today's biggest global challenge and has created a multidimensional crisis. However, the crisis gives the momentum for us to build a better world in the post-pandemic era, to maintain environmental sustainability and to create an inclusive future. The crisis has shown the interdependence between people, prosperity, and planet. Today, the world is also at the tipping point of the climate crisis. The UNFCCC report shows that current countries' commitment under Paris Agreement will contribute to an increase of 16% emission rate and the temperature increase of 2.7 degrees Celsius at the end of the century. This reality is far from the Paris Agreement target of limiting temperature increase below 1.5 to 2 degrees by the end of the century. Let me, share, let me share my view. First, G20 needs to lead by example in the effort to realize green development, renewable energies, and climate change action. G20 represents 85% of the world economy. Our collective action will certainly bring big impact 
and can lead the transformation toward green economy. For, Indone for Indonesia, we are on the track of reducing our emission rate of 29% with our own efforts and are ready to reach up to 41% reduction with international support. Indonesia aims to achieve net zero emission target by 2060 and forest and other land use net sink by 2030. We have also set the target to reach 20% supply of renew renewable energy in 2025. Second, it is important to forge international cooperation in supporting development developing countries. Financing, technical support, and technology transfer are needed by developing countries to transform their economies toward low carbon development. We need political will and leadership for all countries, including for the parliament, to step up the ambition and adaptation action as well as energy transition. However, this is no one size fits all policy and energy transition needs to be carried out gradually. Third, social aspects should be promoted alongside with economic and environmental dimension. Green economic growth must also be inclusive. It should advance equity, narrows down inequality in the society and engages all stakeholders. The development of green industries and renewable energy will create green jobs. We need to enhance the awareness of our people of environmental sustainability. The local communities must be at the heart of the environmental protection effort. They should be involved from, from planning, execution, and to evaluation pace. Indonesia has implemented social forestry program that helps community to improve their, their living standard through forest ut utilization activities. Green, green economy transformation requires our shared commitment of all countries. The world already accumulated abundance of knowledge, science, technology, and various resources. What we lack of is trust and the commitment to work together and to help one One another. minute left. The P20 should be able to help synergizing and combining the potential of various countries to face global challenges and create a shared future. I believe that through our cooperation in P20, we can help realizing a stronger and more sustainable global economic recovery. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you Speaker Moharani. We now go to Speaker Park of Korea. Thank you, Chair, dear fellow colleagues. In an effort to advance the common goal of a sustainable world, the Republic of Korea has taken bold steps toward a 2050 carbon neutral society through its Green New Deal. For the initiative, the government plans to invest more than 65 billion US dollars by 2025. The focus on this policy is primarily placed on encouraging the private sector's participation and providing support for in innovation efforts. Concrete outcomes have already begun to emerge. Along the West Coast, local residents, governments, and businesses have come together to create the world's largest offshore wind farm that can generate 8.2 giga, 8 gigawatts of electricity. Local residents participating in this project will have shares and receive a specified portion of the profits. This can be referred to as a resident inclusive green development. On the east coast, the city of Ulsan the international capital of Korea is building a floating offshore wind farm that can generate 6 gigawatts and facility to produce green hydrogen. In other areas, we are also witnessing 
the voluntary participation of many individual businesses. In the transportation sector, over 1.2 million vehicles will be converted to electric and hydrogen vehicles by 2030. Financial institutions are also joining in, the, in this effort with carbon neutrality climate finance. Korea's National Pension Service, one of the world's three largest pension funds, has already declared a coal-free initiative. Korea's state-run banks will expand financial support for green sectors by doubling their current share of total financing to 13% by 2030. The government intends, intends to establish a Korean-style green taxonomy for the smooth operation of green financing. Along with the government measures, the Korean National Assembly took active and preemptive initiatives. In 2012, we adopted the Act on Allocation and the Trading of Greenhouse Gas Emissions Permits to introduce Asia's first nationwide emissions trading scheme. In January 2020, we passed the world's first hydrogen-related laws, taking note of hydrogen's potential as a green energy source. Now the country is fostering technological innovations to bolster the hydrogen ecosystem. In September last year, we adopted a resolution urging the government to raise its 2030 NDC further. Korea's enhanced 2030 NDC target will One be presented left. at COP26. And this August, the Korean National Assembly passed the Framework Act on Carbon Neutrality and Green Growth. These laws provided the government with police tools and the institutional mechanisms for the 2030 NDC target increase and the 2050 carbon neutrality objective. Fellow speakers, it is critical that we take the, these actions together Global partnership is a must, not an option. In this May, Korea hosted the part Partnering for Green Growth and Global Goals 2030, or a P4G Summit to bring about solidarity and inclusiveness in the international community. Korea will serve as a bridge between advanced Five minutes and up. developing countries we are ready to share our know-how and support developing countries through the Global Green Growth Institute and the Green Climate Fund. Five minutes I to seek to request goal. your other active cooperation to ensure that these projects are properly financed as promised and implemented as planned. Thank you. We are now going over to Speaker Centop of Turkey. Speaker Santo. Değerli Meclis Başkanları, değerli katılımcılar, birinci oturumda yaptığımız değerlendirmelerde insanlığın son iki senedir tarihin en büyük sınamalarından biriyle karşı karşıya olduğunu ifade etmiştik. Salgın sadece ekonomik yapılarımızı değil, hayatımızın her alanını derinden etkiledi ve etkilemeye devam ediyor. Salgının olumsuz tesirlerinin toplumlarımızda köklü değişiklere yol açtığını da müşahede ediyoruz. Salgının sosyal ve çevresel etkileri maalesef bu olumsuzlukların başında geliyor. Covid-19 salgınının mevcut sorunları daha da derinleştirmesi, bütün insanlığın süratli ve kararlı adımlar atmasını zaruri hale getiriyor. Dünya ekonomisinde toparlanma eğiliminin başladığına şahit olsak da söz konusu iyileşmenin henüz salgın öncesi dönemi birçok bakımdan yakalayamadığını da somut verilerle tespit ediyoruz. Başta OECD olmak üzere birçok saygın kurum açılan makasın kapanması için hala ciddi adımlara ve hatta biraz zamana ihtiyaç bulunduğunu 
ifade etmektedir. Toparlanma sürecinin koordineli ve gelecekteki benzer şoklara hazırlanmayı da kapsayacak şekilde oluşturulmasının ne kadar önemli olduğunu da tecrübe ederek öğrendik. Değerli arkadaşlar, çevresel sürdürülebilirlik kavramı çerçevesinde Cumhurbaşkanımız Sayın Recep Tayyip Erdoğan'ın Birleşmiş Milletler 76. Genel Kurulu'ndaki konuşmasında vurguladığı küresel hiçbir soruna, krize, çağrıya kayıtsız kalmayan Türkiye'nin iklim değişikliği ve çevrenin korunması hususlarında da üzerini, üzerine düşeni yapacağı ifadesini hatırlatmak isterim. Bildiğiniz gibi Türkiye Paris İklim Anlaşması'na imza atan ilk ülkelerden biridir. Ancak yükümlülüklerle ilgili adaletsizlikler sebebiyle bu anlaşmayı yürürlüğe koymamıştık. Zira bize göre iklim ve çevre bağlamında alınacak tedbirlerin dünyamızı kirleterek bugünkü felaketlere sebep olmuş ülkeler lehine ve kalkınmakta olan ülkelerin gelişimini engelleyecek şekilde ve onların aleyhine işletilmemesi lazımdır. Son dönemde bu çerçevede kaydedilen mesafeyi mütakiben anlaşmanın onaylanmasını yeniden gündemimize aldık. Atılacak yapıcı adımlara uygun şekilde ve ulusal katkı beyanımız zemininde Paris İklim Anlaşması'nı Türkiye Büyük Millet Meclisi Genel Kurulu'nda dün kabul ettik. Bu gelişmeyi G20 Parlamento Başkanları zirvesinde sizlerle paylaşmaktan memnuniyet duyuyorum. Sayın Meclis Başkanları, dünyayı her birimiz için yaşanır kılabilmek ancak bütün insanlar için yaşanabilir bir dünya kurmaktan geçiyor. Salgın süreci adeta bu hakiki ihtiyacı bir kez daha ve güçlü bir şekilde herkese hissettirmiştir. Açık bir şekilde gördük ki dünyanın herhangi bir yerindeki bir insanın hastalığı her birimizin ülkesindeki başka bir insanın aynı hastalığa yakalanması anlamına gelmektedir. Aynı şekilde eğer başka ülkelerde barış yoksa asgari insani şartlarda hayat sürmek mümkün değilse hiçbirimiz evimizde huzurlu olamayız. Dünyada gerçekten ne olup bittiğini samimiyetle ve empatiyle anlamaya çalışmazsak başka devletlere, halklara, bütün dünya insanlarına ulusal çıkar elde etme amacı dışında bizim gibi Adem ve Havva'nın eşit çocukları olarak bakamazsak kurduğumuz retoriklerle kendi kendimizi avutur, aldatır dururuz. Salgın sürecinin ardından dünyada siyasi ve ekonomik ilişkilerin yeniden şekilleneceği açıkça görülmektedir. Bu bağlamda insanla tabiat, insanla toplum, insanla devlet arasındaki ilişkileri ve nihayetinde bu temelde oluşturulacak devletler arası ilişkileri sağlıklı bir şekilde yeniden kurgulayacak bir söylem geliştirmek mecburiyetindeniz. İnsanı merkeze almadığımız hiçbir yaklaşım kalıcı bir çözüm üretemeyecektir. Değerli meclis başkanları, Türkiye olarak bu anlayışla ihtiyaç içindeki ülkelerin salgında daha iyi mücadele edebilmeleri için çok taraflı platformlarda gerçekleştirilen çalışmalarda aktif rol alıyoruz. İnsani ve kalkınma yardımlarında 2017 yılından itibaren Türkiye en çok insani yardım yapan ülkedir. 2017 yılına kadar milli gelirine oranla birinci sırada olan Türkiye, 2017 yılından itibaren toplamda en çok insani yardım yapan ülke haline gelmiştir. Ülkemiz salgının başlangıcından bu yana Büyük İslam düşünürü Mutasavvuf Mevlana'nın ümitsizliğin ardında nice ümitler var, karanlığın ardında nice güneşler var deyişiyle 160 ülke ve 12 uluslararası teşkilata destek olarak salgınla mücadele bağlamında üzerine düşen sorumluluğu yerine getirmiştir. Benimsediğimiz bu anlayışın sağlıklı bir çevre, daha müreffeh bir dünya için bütün insanlığa faydalar getirmesini ümit ediyor. Hepinizi saygıyla selamlıyorum. Thank you, Speaker Santor. We now go to the Speaker of the House of Lords. No, John, I'm going to keep my eye on you. <laughs> surrounded by counterparts from around the world discussing matters of common concern and building working relationships. And there is no substitute for gathering together in person. The impact of COVID-19 pandemic has been catastrophic and it's right that our minds should now turn to recovery. It is worth acknowledging, however, that the impact of the 2008 global financial crisis is still being felt globally. The impact of that crisis will only have compounded the difficult situation for some. As Lord Haig of Richmond, William Haig, the former UK Foreign Secretary and leader of the Conservative Party has said, those who are well adapted for such a crisis like COVID-19 will never have had it so good. But for the rest, the truth is that pre-existing inequality will be made worse. But perversely, 
A crisis always presents an opportunity. Indeed, Winston Churchill is reported to have said, never let a good crisis go to waste. We should seize the moment and rethink the way we order and behave as economic actors. In the UK post-2008, this meant a root and branch reform of the financial sector itself. In 2013, the Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards, on which I served, recommended a range of bold measures, including tighter banking regulation, underlining the role of individual responsibility and the responsibility of banks themselves when taking risks and reforming the way the market worked and clarifying the important responsibilities of governments and legislators. As legislators, we have a responsibility to shape the laws and the regulation which govern the lives of the citizens we serve. This means being bold and forward thinking, not simply reactive. In Westminster, the House of Lords has established a select committee to consider the long-term implications of the COVID-19 pandemic on the economic and social well-being of the United Kingdom. And I am pleased to say that they have already reported on the opportunities presented by a more digital world and made recommendations to the UK government concerning the worrying trend of the most disadvantaged and marginalised people in society being further marginalised and disadvantaged by the rapid online revolution. To develop the point further, I would like to draw on the comments of Mariana Mazzucuto, Professor in Economics of Innovation and Public Value at the University College London, who incidentally enjoys Italian citizenship. She has argued, and I quote, it is not enough for governments to simply intervene as a spender of last resort when markets fail or crises occur. They should actively shape markets so that they deliver the kind of long-term outcomes that benefit everyone. It's for others in the political arena to decide how this is to be done. But I agree that this is the moment which we should look at once again at rewriting the rules of the game. And I suggest that we should be bold in doing so. I would also like to draw on the thoughts of another individual who's urged policymakers to reconsider how global economics work, Pope Francis. A year ago, almost to the day, he laid out his vision for a post-COVID world by uniting the core elements of his social teachings into an encyclical aimed at inspiring a revived sense of the human family. Fratelli Tutti was released on the feast day of his namesake, St. Francis of Assisi. He One said minute. the pandemic had confirmed his belief that the current political and economic institutions must be reformed to address the legitimate needs of the people most harmed by the coronavirus. I agree. Global problems demand global solutions and because of that, we should feel compelled to work together. With such comments in mind, it is imperative that social and environmental sustainability have to feature in the modern economic policy. Colleagues, it's time for urgent and collective action, and that is now. Thank you, Lord Speaker. We now go to President Lukibo of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. President Lukibo. Congo. Je voudrais remercier toutes les autorités parlementaires et gouvernementales d'Italie pour l'accueil réservé à notre délégation. Je voudrais par cette même occasion saluer l'initiative du P20. En fait, nous sommes les représentants des peuples et à ce titre nous détenons un pouvoir, un grand pouvoir, qui puisse nous permettre d'agir et de faire agir nos gouvernements respectifs. Que pouvons-nous faire pour relancer le développement économique en termes de durabilité sociale et environnementale après la pandémie du coronavirus 
Ce qu'il faut retenir de cette pandémie, l'une des leçons à tirer, c'est que, comme l'a dit le représentant de l'OCDE, il faut une nouvelle humanité. Et à nous d'ajouter que la planète est comme une seule famille et même un seul corps. Lorsqu'un membre est malade, c'est tout le corps qui est malade. D'où nous devons combattre les injustices telles que les a rappelés le président de la Banque africaine de développement, M. Adesina. Imaginez qu'un pays comme la République démocratique du Congo, qui a 153 millions d'hectares de forêt, donc deuxième poumon du monde, n'a même pas 0,1% de crédit carbone. Et comme l'a si bien dit à Désina, toute l'Afrique ne bénéficie que de 3% de crédit carbone. C'est une injustice lorsqu'on considère que l quand on nourrit un corps, on doit nourrir tous les membres. On ne peut pas mourir, nourrir le pied gauche et laisser le, le pied droit. Et, et donc, nous, nous tenions à apporter une nouveauté à cette rencontre. C'est que les catastrophes qui sont inhérentes de conditions climatiques, il y en a de différentes natures. Mais l'autre qui nous menace le plus pour le moment, c'est la désertification d'une grande partie de l'Afrique. Lorsque vous regardez l'Afrique australe, elle est menacée par le désert de Kalahari. L'Afrique subsaharienne par le désert du Sahara. Et donc, ces deux déserts sont en train de menacer l'Afrique centrale, qui constitue le poumon, le deuxième poumon du monde, et qui renferme aussi 55% d'eau douce. D'où la République démocratique du Congo a proposé un schéma, c'est-à-dire la création d'un fonds national de lutte contre les risques de désertification et de dégradation des terres. Nous vous invitons les uns et les autres à pouvoir euh, apporter leur contribution quant à cette lutte que mène la République démocratique du Congo, parce que nous sommes au bon lieu et au bon moment devant le P20 qui renferme 80% des richesses mondiales, 75% du commerce international et donc un grand pouvoir économique pour pouvoir déjà prévenir, parce qu'on dit « vaut mieux prévenir que guérir ». Je termine par le vaccin pour dire que ça doit être aussi un droit pour tous et donc un bien commun, un bien mondial. Je vous remercie. Thank you, President Luquibo. We now go to the Speaker of the Senate of the Netherlands, Speaker of Zuiden. Speaker. Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, it is a very great honor to be here today. It is a great privilege for the Dutch Parliament and for me personally, to participate in this meeting. We are grateful to the Italian presidency of the G20 for the invitation to our country. More specifically, I would like to thank my colleagues from the Italian parliament, Mrs. Alberti Casellati and Mr. Fico, as well as the president of the Interparliamentary Union, Mr. Pacheco, to allow us to join here today. Grazie mille. I believe that our meeting today is even more valuable since the COVID-19 pandemic prevented us from meeting each other in interparliamentary conferences for a long time. It is a great pleasure to be able to meet you again here today. Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, I would like to contribute some thoughts to our important discussions on this topic rebooting economic growth in terms of social and environmental sustainability. The title of this session combines three key elements of our societies, the economic element, the environmental element, and the social element. 
or as the Italian G20 presidency puts it forward, the three Ps, prosperity, planet and people. As representatives of the people, parliaments should keep in mind that these three elements are crucial for successful, sustainable and prosperous societies. A well-functioning economy to provide jobs and welfare to the people. A healthy and well-preserved environment for people to live in. And a fair and free social structure that provides equal rights, justice, freedom and democracy. Needless to say that these three elements should strengthen each other instead of affect each other in a negative way. That is why I am happy with the priorities of the Italian G20 presidency, the three Ps, and its efforts to regard these three elements as interconnected pillars. Your Excellencies, dear colleagues, allow me to shortly turn back to our discussions two years ago during the P20 summit that took place in Tokyo, Japan. We spoke about our future societies, how digitalization, robotization and big data will change the way we work, the way we interact and the way we live, economically, environmentally and socially. Societies where artificial intelligence makes our life more comfortable, where innovations in the medical field make us more healthy, where technology increases our standard of living and provides us with the possibility to organize our economies in an environmentally friendly way. Speaking today about rebooting economic growth and about environmental and social sustainability, I would like to stress that innovation and technology will play a very important role in this. Technological innovation helps us to solve many challenges we face in our societies on the economic, social and environmental levels. But on the other hand, it is wise to realize that innovation at the same time appears to be a challenge in itself. A challenge for our societies and for our democracies. Algorithms, artificial intelligence and big data provide great opportunities, but also serious risks and some important questions for parliamentarians on the fields of accountability and control. One minute left. As parliamentarians, we should invest in our knowledge to be prepared for the society of the future, to be prepared to have the knowledge, the facilities and the ability to oversee the consequences of technological innovation, scrutinize our governments and to also become the parliaments of the future. Your Excellence, Excellencies, dear colleagues, thank you for your attention. It is a great privilege to be here today and I look forward to the rest of our discussions. Thank you. We now go to the Speaker of the Spanish Senate, Speaker Garcia. Muchas gracias, Presidente Fico, queridos, queridos colegas. Me gustaría aportar a este foro una perspectiva que considero humildemente eh, complementaria. Me gustaría, me refiero a la cuestión de la despoblación. Me atrevería a decir que el reto demográfico es la nueva lucha por la igualdad en muchos de nuestros países y es además una prueba de fuego para nuestras democracias. Debemos abordarlo con decisión y audacia. Ninguna otra cosa, desde luego, puede ser aceptable. En este contexto me gustaría hacer mención a los municipios pequeños y a las zonas rurales de nuestros países. Ellos, que han sido una de las principales víctimas de las antiguas políticas fracasadas de austeridad, están llamados a jugar un importantísimo papel en la reconstrucción y en la recuperación tras la pandemia. Lo harán, efectivamente, si desde la Unión Europea y los países que forman parte del G20 se actúa de manera decidida, con ambición y con urgencia, en la lucha contra la despoblación y por la disminución de la brecha de desigualdad que sufren. En España, eh, mientras la población crece en las grandes ciudades, las zonas rurales y de pequeñas poblaciones están sufriendo una pérdida de habitantes sin precedentes. Solo en la última década han perdido un cuarto de millón de habitantes. 
Para acabar con estos graves déficits de nuestras democracias hay que atacar los factores económicos que nos conducen a ellos, porque la distancia entre territorios no se mide solo en kilómetros, se mide en políticas y en recursos, se mide en solidaridad y en cooperación y se mide también en reconocimiento y visibilidad. Por eso debemos ser ambiciosos para disminuir la distancia entre el centro y la periferia, entre el mundo urbano y el mundo rural, porque el aumento de la desigualdad tras la pandemia ya no es un riesgo, es una realidad. A pesar de este diagnóstico, creo que la transformación sostenible de la economía es posible. Para ello, la recuperación pospandemia debe tener un acusado sentido reformador dirigido a lograr una recuperación justa, porque solo una recuperación justa será sostenible. En ese sentido, la creación del Next Generation Europe ha sido una respuesta muy distinta y esencial para apuntalar la salida de la crisis. Hoy es posible encontrar renovadas vías de crecimiento al servicio de la cohesión social y territorial. Un buen ejemplo es el plan de medidas ante el reto demográfico que se ha puesto en marcha en España, con una inversión de más de 10.000 millones de euros que suponen casi el 10% del plan de recuperación, transformación y resiliencia y que pretende ser un revulsivo contra la despoblación y un aliado de la cohesión social y territorial. La reconstrucción no solo curará las heridas de la pandemia en las zonas más despobladas, sino también las que arrastran fruto de la injusticia histórica, la que ha generado el despoblamiento y una importante brecha de inequidad. Por otro lado, hoy es más evidente que nunca la estrecha relación entre la salud del planeta y la salud humana. Por tanto, nuestra posición también debe ser ambiciosa respecto a la sostenibilidad ambiental. El clima debe ser considerado un bien público global. Por eso no puedo dejar de recordar que es precisamente en el mundo rural donde se comprende y se defiende más y mejor la biodiversidad. En definitiva, tenemos que impulsar entre todos la transición ecológica, promover la digitalización del mundo rural, respaldar al turismo sostenible, el fundamento del emprendimiento, disminuir la brecha entre mujeres y hombres, cohesionar los territorios, especialmente los llamados territorios vaciados. Ahora, todos nosotros, todas nosotras, los gobiernos del G20, incluidos los de la Unión Europea, termino ya, presidente, las instituciones europeas y las nacionales, como los que hoy estamos aquí representando ahora nuestros parlamentos, seremos responsables con nuestras decisiones de que millones de ciudadanos que sufren el despoblamiento y la desigualdad pasen a la historia como víctimas de un sistema que les ha dado la espalda o como protagonistas de la reconstrucción de nuestros países y, fundamentalmente, de su propio futuro. Muchas gracias. Can I thank Speaker Garcia? We now come to the Russian Federation with De Deputy Speaker Kostachev. <clears throat> Honorable uh, speakers, dear colleagues, uh, for more than 30 years, the concept of sustainable development, which embodies the trinity of economic, environmental, and social objectives, has remained the fundamental model of the world development. In 2020, the Russian Federation presented its first voluntary national survey on the progress made by our country in implementing the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. The document focuses on extensive social programs. The national projects, labor productivity and employment support, small and medium-sized businesses, support for individual entrepreneurship are focused on providing citizens with decent work and achieving sustained economic growth in the country. The doctrine of food security of the Russian Federation aims at providing the population with safe, high quality and affordable agricultural products, raw materials and food. Russia is constantly working to reduce inequality. This task is being solved within the framework of the national project Demography, by providing financial support to families at the birth of children. The national program, Digital Economy of the Russian Federation, eliminating digital inequality. The national strategy for action, of action for women, ensuring equal rights and equal opportunities for men and women. The national decade of childhood, ensuring the well-being of families with children. 
During the coronavirus pandemic, in order to ensure the financial stability of families with children, as well as to save jobs, parliamentarians adopted about 300 anti-crisis legislative acts. Families with 28 million children were supported. Payments were established to medical and social workers who participated in the fight against the pandemic. In total, almost 600,000 specialists were covered by payments. More than half a million medical and almost 73,000 social workers. Millions of people have been able to keep their jobs through business support, including tax breaks, reduced insurance premiums, and other measures. A healthy population is one of the main priorities for our country. The health care project is aimed at creating a sanitary shield, so to say, a health system that is resilient to new challenges. The reality of globalization is such that these measures will be more effective when correlated with similar measures of neighboring states. Issues of overcoming distrust of vaccination, artificial barriers for international registration of, of vaccines, combined use of vaccines and creating a system of post-COVID rehabilitation require a comprehensive discussion. The challenge of global climate change has enriched the 2030 agenda with new benchmarks. This means switching to clean energy sources and reducing the carbon footprint of all production processes. Russia fully takes into account environmental priorities and the United Nations approved SDGs when developing its medium and long-term economic strategies. Over the past year, our country has prepared and is preparing for approval dozens of documents aimed at environmental reorientation of the Russian economy. Among them are the goals and main directions of sustainable, including green, development of the Russian Federation, the federal law on limiting greenhouse gas emissions, and the strategy for long-term socio-economic development with low what greenhouse mean, gas emissions until 2050. Uh, Russia opposes the politicization and acceleration of the green agenda. We believe that support for global efforts to protect the environment should not be at the expense of the development of states that are not ready for a sharp transition to green rails, especially in the context of an acute economic crisis caused by the coronavirus pandemic and requiring significant investment. Thank you very much. Can I thank everybody for those contributions? I'm now going to go back to replies from our keynote speakers. Speaker Berla, would you like to start? No? Any comments from our two keynote speakers? If not, please, Mr. Adasana. Mr. Adasana? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Speaker. Um, I want to thank all the honorable speakers for all that you said. I think uh, the key, I just want to comment on, on three things. Uh, first is the, uh, the divide between the rural and the urban area. I think that one is very, very critical because most of those that will suffer from the consequences of climate change in our world today are, the, are those in the rural areas and they are least able to actually support that. So I think that's very, very important for us uh, to do. Uh, the second is that we need to also support greater digitalization. And I really like those points that were made because we need to make sure that we have a lot more financial inclusion. Because if you have financial inclusion, they have, people have more, more resources to also be able to adapt uh, to the changes that we see uh, all, around, uh, all around us. And finally is the issue of how we help developing countries in particular to deal with exogenous are climatic shocks. Uh, we have something at the African Development Bank uh, that is called um, African, um, it's a facility anyway, to help countries to insure themselves against exogenous climatic shocks. Um, it's um, very, very important to be able to pay for premiums for that. So the, the, the least developed countries, the small island states, don't have the resources to adapt. And that facility for us is about $250 million. We need to be able to use that facility to support countries so they can get pay house of maybe about a, uh, uh, a billion dollars. It's going to be uh, very, very uh, uh, important uh, uh, for them. 
And finally is the role that you all play as honorable speakers in terms of legislations. I think the, the, the, for me, I feel very encouraged today, uh, honorable speaker, that I'm here to see the leaders of our parliament actually giving voice to the issue of climate, the issue of uh, inclusion, and the issue of social participation in the process. So I want to really thank you very much. All I want to do is just to thank you for really inviting me to be here and thank you for your leadership as we build a world that is more prosperous and a world that we can live a better future for all of our children and grandchildren. Thank you very much, Honorable Speaker. Can, can I first of all thank our keynote speakers, but thank all speakers and colleagues for this interesting and useful session on promotion of sustainable development in both social and environmental terms. This now wraps up the first day of our summit. But don't dash off. End of the session, staff are going to take us for the family photo. Let's get the family together. We're going to go through those doors. So please, let's make our way for the photo.